to all y'all who don't listen regularly to this program, we're about to talk about lo- farmland preservation and some trust. So this may bore yeah. you. But look, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But look, before before we go to that, let me follow up on what Joe said. Uh, the program, I think all of us take great pride of not asking gotcha questions. We're not here to embarrass. We're no. here to try to provide as much no. information as we possibly can, and we try to acquire that inf- information in a very civil, very polite correct manner so that's why you're not going to hear us go in and start throwing a lot of punches below the belt because that's not our style anyway <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's let's get to the uh, farmland protection here in uh, the eastern panhandle and uh, land trusts and, and such mark Chavon is with us as well as bonnie stubblefield the and, and this is a conflict of interest, the spouse of Bill Stubblefield. No, the other way around. Did I'm you, the spouse of Bonnie. Did you provide her with all the questions we're going to ask Bill? No, you kidding me. I don't understand that. Uh, but let, let's talk about the, sta- the state of it here in the eastern panhandle, because this has become an issue more so in the last couple of years with all the development in Berkeley County. There are a lot of folks who enjoy living by a farm that suddenly has turned into a thousand house development and, and maybe... Uh, that might be good for the folks buying the house, but for the folks who've been around a lot, they're not so happy about it as much, Bonnie and Mark. Yeah. What? what uh, talk to me about farmland preservation. Yeah. Where are we with that in terms of uh, how difficult it is to acquire that status? Well, first of all, let me, let me mention that um, the program is voluntary. Mm-hmm. So when a farmer decides to sell his land to a developer, they've got that right to do that. And that's not contrary to our program. But for the people that want to see their land protected forever, we're the perfect program for that. How does that work? How do you apply? You can apply at any time. We do have a season that ends at the end of um, October each year, and that's when we uh, score the properties. It's a very competitive process. We purchase easements. Um, We also accept donations, but most people end up wanting to be compensated. So you apply. in December, we score the properties. By January, the properties have been, um, the scores have been vetted by the board, and they make the funding decisions. We actually set the money aside each year at the beginning of the fiscal year, which is a decision that's made in July. Um, this current year, we set $1.4, $1.5 million aside. Mm-hmm. We also have um, not quite $300,000 in a match with the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection. That program is specific to protecting land within the Back Creek watershed. So this is a kind of a weird year that we have two kind of parallel funding systems. Um, last year, we also set 1.5 million aside. We just closed the first of a batch of easements. Um, and I'm hoping that within the next month or two, we'll close the remaining four. That will take us to 80 easements total and about 80 200 acres protected. So it's a little more than 11, 12% of all of the agricultural land in the county has been permanently protected. Okay, and, and how does this work for the person who puts their property in farmland preservation? They, they, do they draw an income from it? Uh, if they change their mind, can they ultimately sell it again or what? It's a one-time payment. So we're purchasing the development rights off of the property, and that's an appraised um, amount. So Um, Whatever the current market value is. Right. And it's technically the difference between the fair market value of the property um, versus what's called the restricted use value. That's what the land would be worth if it was already encumbered by an easement. Um, So as an example, if the property fair market value comes in at 10,000 an acre, um, the fair market value or the restricted use value comes in at 4,000 an acre, then the difference between those two numbers is 6,000 an acre. That's the subdivision value or the conservation easement value. That's what we'll, we'll pay, provided that the property owner didn't ask less than that. Um, by state law, we can only pay the lower of either the asking price or the appraised value. So it's a one-time payment. Mm-hmm. It is not a grant. Um, there's tax ramifications. We always remind applicants that they're going to want to sit down with a lawyer and with a financial planner or a tax advisor if they get chosen for funding and they move forward. Uh, when the dust settles, the, the farmer still owns their land. They can sell it. They can convey it by um, uh, an estate to, to, to children or to next of kin. The Farmland Protection Board, however, also has a vested interest in the property moving forward in that we now have purchased and own the subdivision rights, which we extinguish. So in addition to the farm not being able to be subdivided in the future, 
Um, some uses, like all industrial use on the land, are going to be prohibited moving forward. All non-agricultural commercial use is going to be prohibited. Um, but residential use and certainly all agricultural uses are permitted. Now, if I change my mind 20 years later, <clears throat> land values, let's say, have gone crazy like they did recently, and a developer comes along and makes me an offer I can't refuse, can I pay the money back and then go sell to the developer? And unfortunately, no, you can't. And that's in state law. Um, and it mirrors the position of the Internal Revenue Service with the United States that if you're going to take a tax deduction off of the purchase of a conservation easement, that easement has to be perpetual in nature. And that's true of almost all states. 49 of the 50 states have some sort of a conservation easement program in state law, and almost all of them recognize the permanency to be in, in concordance with the Internal Reve Revenue Service. Um, Maryland has a has permanent easements, but they also had the option of doing like a 30-year easement. But those are not enabled under West Virginia law, so our easements have to be permanent. Nope. Yeah. A complementary to the farmland preservation is a land trust. And Bonnie, would, would you address the difference between land trust and farmland preservation? Sure. Uh, land trust is, uh, I'll start out by saying it's a nonprofit organization. Uh, and we are all volunteers. It is, has uh, been around now for 27 years, and, and we, from the very beginning, it was all volunteer. And, um, and so we do not, as the Farmland Protection Board does, has the ability to, to purchase um, the development rights. What we, have, what we do is the landowner donates um, to us the, and the easement. And for that donation to this nonprofit organization, the Land Trust, they are able to take the value of that land that we that are part of the easement and basically go to the Internal Revenue Service and use it as a way to offset taxes. So theirs is a, is a, uh, uh, a tax um, relief as opposed to actually ret retaining cash. But the other parts of it are the same. It is in perpetuity. Uh, and they have the right to sell the uh, easement or sell the property uh, to another person, but the person at that time when they buy it is held accountable for all of the information in the, in the deed of conservation easement, so they can't do any changes to that. And again, no, it, it is the development rights that are, are being released, and, uh, and so as a, as a result, uh, we... We similarly wind up at the end with, with uh, 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 land and, and working closely with landowners and closely, we work closely with the Farmland Protection Board. Um, so it, it's a nice match uh, or it's a nice partnership in, in the eastern panhandle because we're able to, sa to save and preserve thanks to landowners who really want to see their land stay as it is and they, they have a, an emotional attachment to it. Uh, and so that that then means that that will stay and be be part of the the landscape, if you will, of the Eastern Panhandle. And I think all of us, uh, the land trust came into being in the 19, mid 1990s when there was a tremendous growth in the Eastern Panhandle, and we are doing incredible amount of growth right now today. So again, it's it. Uh, Land conservation is a, a very important process here. Bonnie, Mark said had around 8,200 acres uh, in farmland protection. How many acres do you have preserved or protected in land trust? Right now we have uh, a little over uh, 4,800 acres, uh, 4,800 acres. Um, and we're uh, in the process, of, and we have 51 easements. We're in the process of working in Jefferson County with putting a large 120-acre easement in that's part of the Shepherdstown battlefield. And uh, so at this point, we, 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 are, we will be the land conservation organization that will hold the deed of conservation uh, or easement. Um, however, um, there are other parties that are doing the financial uh, to preserve that. It's part of the, 
Landmarks Commission in the Historic Landmarks Commission in Jefferson County that's doing it. So between the two, uh, you have over 13,000 uh, acres now. Right. In your case, Farmland uh, Protection, you're talking about only Berkeley County. In Bonnie's case, she's talking about Berkeley County, Jefferson County, and a little bit of Morgan County. County. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yep. We know uh, through um, uh, Land Trust, uh, uh, Mark, all the money comes. Uh, there's no money involved. They just make the donation to get a tax benefit. For farmland protection, where do you get your money from, both state and federal? If you will. All right, the fed, at the state level, um, each county that has an active farmland protection board uh, receives money through the transfer tax on real property. Uh, the state law that enables farmland protection boards has a cap of no more than $2.20 per $1,000 valuation on the transaction. It's up to the county commission or county council as to whether they want to go all the way up to that $2.20. Could I interrupt very quickly? What are we doing in Berkeley County? A two twenty. Two twenty. Yeah, so we're at the max, okay. And I think we've been at the max for a long time, and that's true of almost all the counties. I, what generally happens is that as a county creates a new board, um, the county commission typically wants to kind of take things easy for a while. So the, the newest board is over in Harrison County, which is Clarksburg. And they're, I think, at a dollar ten per thousand dollar valuation. So they're halfway. Um, they're still pulling in a lot of money. Um, that board is growing quickly. They're already talking about hiring a part-time executive director. But but in Berkeley County, which let's yeah, in Berkeley County, we're two twenty, and uh, that money is uh, is split how? That no, that two dollars and twenty cent per thousand dollar valuation goes exclusively to the farmland protection board. Is that right? Board. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, th there's additional um, components of the transfer tax that go to the county commission directly, and uh, a part used to go to the West Virginia Housing Development Fund, and that is being slowly reallocated to local county government. So I think when the dust settles, and I'm hazy on this, it'll be five dollars and fifty cent per thousand going toward county council and two dollars twenty cent per thousand valuation going to the farm loan protection so all the transfer tax will shortly be split between farmland uh, protection and the county council that's right okay good and i think john hardy has been working on that uh, mm -hmm. yeah joe well, i was uh, enjoying bill interviewing his wife um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the only time i get to do it joe so <laughs> The rest, the rest of the time, uh, she, I'm being dictated to. <laughs> that's not right. That's I don't think right. you're helping your cause that's, here. That's not right. I'm no, no, trying to yeah. be funny. But. Let's move on, Bill, before you get in trouble. Uh, Mark and Bonnie, uh, if I came to you as a landowner in Berkeley County and I was interested in this program, one question I would ask is, what is your experience with others who have done this, have placed their land in farmland protection? What's the experience in terms of marketability of that land in the future? What, what does uh, your experience tell you about that, and how would you answer that question? Bonnie, you want to take that first? Sure. Um, in the case of the land trust, um, because the, the people that have, have uh, put an easement on their land, the first land, landowners that did it, and really cared about it and want to see it, it continue, because of the aging of, of the generation that did that, um, and some of the younger, their children, are not interested in, in staying in this particular area. So we actually have quite a few new, new owners that have purchased uh, the land and the, and the conservation easement the, that's on it, and, and uh, we're, we have we're enjoying being with them. They're they're just as excited about uh, taking over the stewardship of uh, and ownership of the land as the original owner did. So, it's not an issue for us. And it it isn't an issue with us either. We're seeing um, new property owners come in, second generation, in some cases third generation property owners. Um, the art of that industry, that side is called stewardship, and uh, we take that very seriously. So we want to meet with the new property owners. We reach out to real estate agents when they are um, listing a property that's under easement to make sure that everybody's on the same page. We actually have uh, a publication which is available on our website specifically for lawyers and real estate agents within the real estate industry so they understand kind of the nuances of easements. One of the benefits of these 
programs, although recently this has been a very weird real estate market. But traditionally, property owners know that when you've sold your subdivision rights off of your land, you've devalued your property at the fair market value moving forward. Um, and so technically that makes it possible, and this has happened a couple of times, where young farmers are able to purchase an eased property because it is not um, going to bear the full fair market value that it would if the subdivision rights hadn't been extinguished. And, and that's part of the benefit of the program is that young farmers um, can get into the business because otherwise this is a very capital intensive business of doing agriculture. Hey, uh, we only have about a minute left here. and I want to get in Steve Catlett's question quickly from the Berkeley County Council. Uh, Steve says, I think the land trust properties can be used for public use. Can Bonnie clarify this? Um, well, I, I don't know what I have public use, I suppose, if you want to do an event or something. No, parks on. and recreation could it be. Pa you parks and Rec, is what you're saying, Bill? Yeah, I, oh. I think that's what Steve's saying. Could be, could uh, Parks and Rec have develop a facility on land trust property? No. No, we never have. Uh, I don't know whether it's not possible. Uh, but we have, but uh, that has not been the case. Hey, I want to. We're out of time. I want to thank uh, uh, Bonnie and Mark. Thanks so much for coming in. Uh, if we didn't get to everything you wanted to cover, we'll, I'd love to have you back on a day when we're uh, a little less busy, as, as, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks put for that politely. Yeah. Uh, thank you both for coming in, Joe. Thanks for joining us via telephone. Hang out. We'll do a final minute coming up in a moment. Okay.